Well, today we're going to be focusing kind of, we're going to be using Mark chapter 8, verse 38 as kind of the launching point of today's sermon, as it is a culmination of what Jesus had been teaching his disciples up until this point. And we're going to be kind of going through almost the entire chapter of chapter 8, but I think Jesus is wanting to show us today a theme that our culture, our society is facing, not just outside the church, but particularly inside the church, on how we're to live our lives and the role that God and his word plays in our life. So with that, let us read uh, just, a, it's called the way of the cross, and it's Verse 34 through 38. Then he called, he being Jesus, then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. Notice how Jesus is saying, for himself and for the gospel. It will be kind of a theme. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. Now, one of the reasons why that statement is so important, I want us to stop and make sure that we spend time on it, is because salvation is a huge part of not just our own personal journey, but also, also the gospel that we are to be sharing with the world. And so we need to make sure that we understand salvation as clearly as we can so that we can be more effective at communicating the gospel message and living out our own life. So for instance, let's start off with, what does it look like to be ashamed of Jesus? But also remember, he put an and in there. Then he said, also the, his words. So there's two different ways we can be ashamed of Jesus. And sometimes we may not realize that we, in one way we're strong and bold for Jesus, but in another way we might be actually a little ashamed, not realizing it. So let's go through some, uh, some examples. For, first off, being ashamed of Jesus. I was in high school at a Chevy Sprint. Um, it was a three-cylinder little tiny car that now, if I wanted to, I could probably lift and roll over if I wanted to all by myself. It had three cylinders, two worked. The other one was just there to encourage the others. Um, and I would, I would eat a large breakfast if I could, and then I wouldn't spend my lunch money, and that would be my gas money for the week. And so I'd usually skip lunch. And the, my senior year, the second half of my senior year, I didn't have a seventh period. So I would just, usually I'd go and hang out in my car a lot of times, and I would just listen to Christian music. But when school got out, sometimes, I can remember three instances, I think there were more, but I can only remember three, where when my friends started or people I knew, or I wanted to impress, or I didn't want them to think poorly of me, they'd walk by my car. I noticed that when I listened to the Christian station, not the secular, regular stations, I never touched the dial, but if I had it loud, sometimes I would turn it down just a little bit, and I would justify it, like, well, I don't want to insult anyone, I don't want anyone to think that I'm being rude by playing loud music, and it was just a justification to show that I was ashamed, and I didn't want people to hear that I was listening to Jesus. And God taught me a lot through those instances. I always thought in my head, well, someone's gonna, someone might say something, like turn that stuff down or, you know, be like, oh, you're a Christian or you're a Jesus freak. Um, at that time, there was a CD that came out and a song, Jesus Freak. But anyways, that's a side point. But I was, I was ashamed in my actions and then God spoke to me and then there were several times where I'm like, I went to go do it, I'm like, I fought it, and I remember like, no, 
don't touch it. If someone says something, then just deal with it. And I remember just sitting in my car, and a couple times I had my eyes closed, and then someone would be like, hey, I like this song. Or they would say, hey, I like this station. You listen to it too? And I was surprised. And never once did my fears actually come to realization. Now, I'm not saying people don't, wouldn't say, criticize what I was listening to, but my fear and my shame in Christ was evident of my lack of relationship that I had with Jesus and understanding of who he was. Other reasons why people might, in action, might show that they're ashamed of Jesus is not wanting to share Jesus because what other people might think of their faith in Jesus. Maybe I confess to be a Christian, but my actions haven't lived that out in a way where if I told people I was a Christian, they'd be like, how are you a Christian when you do this, this, and this? Peter, after spending three years with Jesus, was ashamed of Jesus and his actions. Because the night of Jesus' arrest, Jesus told him, like, hey, you're going to deny me three times before the rooster crows. And the rooster crowed three times, and Jesus looks at Peter, and Peter looks at Jesus, and it says that Peter went away and wept bitterly. It's because he was ashamed of his actions. He was ashamed in how he represented or the lack of representation of Jesus. Sometimes we hide Jesus to gain social status or at least keep our social status. Those are just a couple of examples of what it would be like to be ashamed of Jesus. But what are some examples of what it means to be ashamed of Jesus' words? Some people might say, I'm a, I'm a follower of Jesus. But they don't share the gospel because they're ashamed of what that message might come across as. But John 14, 6 says, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's a controversial statement right there. Our culture is very tolerant of if you believe in heaven and hell and a God, that's okay, as long as you're open to the fact that there's many ways to be saved. But that's not what Jesus says. He says he's the only way. And so that's socially confrontational. Another person I was talking with at one point was confiding that everyone knows that they're a Christian, but storm after storm after storm hit their life, and they got to the point where they were having a hard time telling people that I believe in Jesus because people were starting to say, well, God loves you. Why does this stuff keep happening to you? And so for a moment, they were struggling with their faith because they're like, well, doesn't God love me? And then they weren't as bold as they were, as they wanted to be, because they didn't see or they couldn't provide evidence to those around them of God's faithfulness and his love. But they said, they laid, they stood on Luke 137, for nothing will be impossible with God. And through the end of that story, the series of storms, they were actually like, hey, this was the outcome of it. And they were able to share that with the people. And then they felt like they were ashamed that they questioned God and his faithfulness. Jesus said in John 7, 7, the world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify that its works are evil. That's a hard statement to make in this world today. Judgment is always around the corner if you step out into, into the world. And so these are things that Jesus has said that might be shameful. You might be like, yeah, I'm a Christian. I would never deny Christ. But do we deny his word? Because Jesus said, if you deny me or my word, I'm going to deny you. So what's the difference between the two? I want to make sure that we're clear that we don't miss a chance for us to make sure that we understand that there is a difference between being ashamed of Jesus' name and being ashamed of his words or what he did. Jesus had been known, is known in the world by lots of different religions 
Buddhist, Islam, as being a good teacher or a prophet. So people aren't resist. So there are groups of people that aren't resistant to you being a follower of Jesus. But would, but you would be considered radical if you believed and followed everything that Jesus said, especially when it comes to the Holy Spirit, not just guiding you, but also speaking to you. It's okay to believe in a God, but it's crazy that a God would speak back to you or communicate to you. Some people don't want to mention Jesus' name because in certain groups and places it carries a stigma. But what Jesus said and did, there was a lot of good stuff, so I can apply that to my life and I can use his words to encourage and help other people. Peter gives us an example in this very chapter of what it's like to confess the name of Jesus, but to deny his word. If we look at, uh, in your sermon notes, I have it, it will also be in the screen, but starting in verse 27, where Peter declares that Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus and his disciples went on to the village around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, who do people say I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Peter answered, you are the Messiah. This isn't a question, this is a firm statement. He's admitting to who Jesus is. Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. And in the very next few verses... It says, he then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He told them plainly about this. Jesus wanted to make sure it was clear that there was no mistake in what he was telling them. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. He said, Jesus, you're the Messiah. I know who you are, but I don't agree or like what you're saying. But then Jesus turned and looked at his disciples. He rebuked Peter. He said, get behind me, Satan. He said, do not do or you do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. And we'll come back to that part in a little bit later. But he rebuked Peter. Because Peter was only halfway in. He was only say, I, I believe you're the Messiah, but I don't trust or like your words. Jesus was getting at either you're ashamed of his if you're either ashamed of his words or ashamed of him, then he will be ashamed of you when he returns. Luke six forty six, Jesus says, Why do you call me Lord Lord? And do not do what I tell you? That's a hard statement. Jesus is getting at if you're ashamed of him, then how can you love him and have him as your Lord and Savior? If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, but in your heart you don't believe in who he is and what he said, then he's not your Savior. For it is not words that save you, but faith in Christ and who he is and who he said and what he said. Because even someone who can't speak, a mute person, can be saved by Jesus. But there is another aspect of being ashamed. This shame is what the Pharisees had for Jesus. See, legalism can cause us to be ashamed of our actions as well. There was a pastor giving a testimony. He was a pastor of a kind of a large church. And he, was, he tells his, his story about how he was a faithful pastor for, I think, over a decade. And he ended up leaving the church because there was an element in his life that he had left out. And as a result, he followed God's word to the T. And it caused harm and pain in people's lives. And we'll talk about what the element he left out. But the element that he left out and his faithfulness to God's word, or so he believed at the time, led to hurt 
ruined relationships and put a burden on his people so much that the church ended up falling apart as he was leaving because people had been beat up. People had been forced to become all about the law and not about the one who gave the law. I've given some examples of what it's like to be ashamed, what it might be to be ashamed of Christ. But there's two categories in this chapter in which we can become ashamed of God as Christians. And Jesus points this out in verse, uh, particularly verse 15. But I'm going to read to you guys verses 14 and 15. It's also in the front of your uh, insert as well. It says, The disciples had forgotten to bring bread, each for one, or except for one loaf they had with them in the boat. Be careful, Jesus warned them. Watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and that of Herod. They go on, the disciples go on to say, are you upset because we only have one loaf? And then Jesus says, didn't I just feed 5,000? Didn't I just feed 4,000 off so little? Why do you still think I'm talking about your physical concerns? And that's what Jesus had pointed out back in verse 33. Your minds are not of what is on God, but on what human concerns. Humans are concerned about clothing. Humans, we are concerned about where we're going to eat, what house, what we're going to drive. Those aren't the concerns of God. And so Jesus is continuing to say, teach a theme to his disciples. And so I want us to take a, a moment to think about what is the yeast of the Pharisees and what is the yeast of Herod? The yeast of the Pharisees that Jesus accused them over and over again was legalism. Legalism is when we attempt to follow God's word on our own strength and will and ability. The pastor said that what he, that retired and left the church, he said what was left in his, in his journey and his teaching was the spirit and work of God and that his own relationship or lack of wasn't evident when he preached, and it wasn't evident when he taught his people on how to live their lives. He was missing the crucial point of God in the relationship, in the midst of our own lives, and in the midst of our relationships with others. The Pharisees were so legalistic that when Jesus finally came on the scene, they were ashamed of the very one that the law and the word of God pointed to. Because they didn't like how he hung out with sinners. They didn't like the mercy and grace that he extended to the people. The Pharisees used God's word as a weapon against Jesus and against the people who tried to challenge their position. The word of God is not a weapon against people. It never has been and it never will be. The purpose of the word of God is A, to reveal and show us that we're sinful. And then the rest of the word of God is about restoration of relationship between us and our Father and between us and each other. That's the whole purpose. It was never meant to be a weapon. The only time it's ever to be used as a weapon is against Satan and his followers. But when we don't have in our hearts, at the center of our hearts, God leading the way, and we follow just the word of God, we fall in the same trap as the Pharisees. And to be honest, with today's technology and resources, we can be more legalistic than the Pharise to, the, to the degree that the Pharisees during Jesus' time would blush. Because we, we have the technology, we have the resources. We can do that. The Pharisees were void of the Spirit of God leading them in their lives. And so they taught the Word of God without God's guidance. An, an example is the woman caught in adultery. There was this trap that they had laid for Jesus, the woman that was caught in adultery. If they, said, they brought to Jesus and said, the Word of God says that we are to stone her to death because she was caught in the act of adultery. And so they were trying to trick Jesus. 
If Jesus said, yes, we need a stoner, then they would go to the Romans and, and they would say, he's trying to uh, commit capital punishment and you need to arrest him because they had that taken away from them. They weren't allowed to do capital punishment. And if Jesus said, no, we can't do that because the Romans were not allowed to, then they would rise up against, they would get the people to rise up against Jesus and say, well, he doesn't honor or believe or enforce the, uh, God's law. And so by diffusing the situation, he dealt down and said, hey, whoever, as he was drawing the sand, he said, whoever has, uh, has no sin in their lives, throw the first stone. And then eventually everyone leaves. But it is at this point that something's different because no one is there to accuse her anymore, just her and Jesus. Jesus is without sin. And if he who wrote the law, knew the law, and is the law, could have easily said, you know what, they, they couldn't judge you because they had sin in their life. But I don't. And you committed sin. And so this is your punishment. Is that what he did? No. He says, you know what, I don't, I don't judge you. Go and sin no more. I'm not going to punish you. I'm going to forgive you. And so Jesus called an audible. And when we don't have the word, we don't have God leading the way as we follow his, his, uh, his word, we can use it as a weapon. We don't know when God wants mercy to be extended or when God wants us to be obedient to what his word says. And so when it comes to us following the word of God, if God's not involved, then we can be guilty of misrepresenting, misusing his word, even though we're following his word. I'll give you another example. When I was helping out in the youth group when I was younger, <clears throat> there was a kid whose mom had just divorced the dad, and it wasn't, wasn't really over much. For the, or the reason for the divorce wasn't really a good reason. And the son, I knew it was coming. I knew this conversation because we were going over the Sermon Mount, and I knew that we were going to be talking about divorce. And in the midst of it, the son said, hey, did my mom sin when she divorced my dad? And I said, yes. And I said, this is why. This is why your parents got divorced, and this is what God's word says. And instantly, a wall went up. He was distant, and he never came back to the church again. Now, was I wrong in what I said? No, because I followed God's word. That's what it says. But was I wrong in how I uh, dealt with the situation? Absolutely. Because I never included God. I never said, God, I, know that, I knew it was coming. I knew he was going to ask it. But did I ask God for guidance? Did I ask God for wisdom? I didn't. And so I can't control. He might have reacted the same way if I would include God. But on my end, I was wrong because God was not a part of that conversation. Because I said, this is God's word, and this is what I'm going to say. And so when we, miss, when we use God's word in our lives without God, we run the risk of using it as a weapon or making it legalistic because we don't know when God says, when God reveals a sin to you and be like, oh, well, I need to go confront that person about that sin. God might be saying, yeah, confront them. But God also might be saying, maybe I revealed that to you so you could pray for them because maybe they're on the cusp of, of surrendering that sin over to God forever. Now, this is hard because we have to be obedient to the will of God. Because sometimes, on the opposite side, Jesus also said, be wary of the yeast of, the, of Herod. Or your translation might say Herodians. It's this, Herod was a representation of someone who only uses the word of God when it's convenient for them. When the world is such desirable that when we are like, I want to be a part of this. I want to have part of this world in my life. I know God's word says don't do this, but, you know, God will forgive me. God will forgive those who misuse his word. I mean, at the end of the day, we're all going to heaven, right? And that's where worldliness seeps in, is we start becoming, we water down Jesus, what Jesus said because we're ashamed of it. 
because it's controversial. Jesus said, I'm the only way to get to heaven. But some pastors, they'll preach a word, they'll preach in, the, in their sermons that Jesus said that, you know what, Jesus died for all. All are going to get to heaven, and all are welcome. But that's not what Jesus said. His salvation is um, conditional. There is a condition to be saved. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him, that belief, that's a condition. It's not given freely. And that belief isn't just a one-time, hey, Jesus, be my Savior, forgive me my sins, thank you, and then you carry on. That belief, that word, is an, actional, is an action, a continuation belief. And it's not just a, well, I'm going to call a lifeline and hope everything's good. That's not what Jesus is saying. Because there are times where God reveals a sin to us, where we see it and be like, man, that's not right. But God, I don't want to cause an issue. And then we're like, you know what? I know what your word says, but I'm just, I'm just going to, I'm just going to trust that you're going to take care of that. And I just, and I'll, I'll pray for them because that's easy for me. I can pray for them at a distance. And I don't need to be a uh, part of their life. Because I'm a sinner, why should I be able to tell them about, a sin, uh, about the sin in their life? Jesus says, uh, take the plank out of your own eye before you help your brother with the speck in his, in his eye. And I think maybe that might be a problem with the church. It's because we're all aware of our own planks and we're not willing to do anything about it. And so why should I tell other people about it? As a pastor, just so you guys know, I'm not perfect. I struggle with sin. But it's not about whether I am perfect of never giving in to sin or temptation. It's about, do, am I allowing God's word to guide me each and every day? Do I use it in how I you, uh, build relationships with people? Do I use it in how I respond to him and how I live out my life? But also, on the other hand, do I have my relationship with Jesus who teaches me of what grace is and what mercy is? How many times have you guys sinned and God would be justified to judge you for the sin in your life one way or another, but he extends grace and mercy? I don't know about you guys, but he does it for me most of the time. And so the purpose of the law was never to be perfect in our actions or lack of or never sinning. The purpose of the law was to restore relationship. And how do we know when God wants to extend grace and mercy versus God wants us to hold each other accountable? We don't know until we allow God to lead us in every aspect of our life. And as we lean on the word of God in one hand and him on the other, God will protect us both from legalism and worldliness. Because without God, we're going to fall one direction or the other. We're going to fall into our old habits, our old identities. There's lots of people in these days where they say, hey, this is my identity. This is who I am. This is my truth. And you have your truth. But all at the heart of that is, is that they're creating their own identity. But we as Christians, our identity is not our old life. Our identity is Christ. Jesus, we read that in verse 34, 33 and 34, about how we die to self. We are no longer ourselves, but we are in the body of Christ, and he is our identity. And so whether we use God's word as a weapon or we water it down to the point where we lead people and ourselves to hell, without God at the center of it, those are, used, those are our paths, and this is what Jesus is warning us about. We, we have to keep him at the center of everything, and we have to uphold his word and trust it. And when we separate the two, we cause harm and pain, both in our lives and those around us. But when we have both in our lives, we enrich people. We give hope through our own testimony of what God can do in us and through us. So I want to end 
today's sermon. With a challenge. Who is Jesus in your life? Are you ashamed of him? Or are you ashamed of his words? Are you fearful to act and do what he's asked us to do? Sometimes we may not think about it, but sometimes inaction or action can cause us to be, to be ashamed of Jesus and what he wants to do. So on one hand, we have a relationship with God where we learn and understand what grace and mercy is. And on the other hand, we have the word of God that teaches us how to live and what God wants us to do. And through both God leading our lives and the word of God teaching us, we can be kept safe and in, from being ashamed of the very God we claim to follow. Today's sermon was to be a challenge to myself. And I hope that you guys are willing to take up the same challenge. I'm not perfect. And it's weird. I'll tell you, as a pastor, I'm not removed from temptation. I have struggles. So it's weird sometimes for me to stand up here and tell you how to, you should live your life in a right relationship with God when I know I struggle sometimes. But it, again, it goes back to, am I being obedient to God leading my life? And am I being obedient to God's word? And trust and know that his mercy and grace and that his firm hand will guide me and teach me. And as I do so, I share with you what God does in my life and hope that you are encouraged and hope that you are being guided in a way that honors not just God, but this position to stand up here behind the pulpit. Because I don't want to stand before God and say, you misrepresented me. You misused my word. You hurt people and you led them either to legalism or to worldliness. And I don't want to be guilty of either. And so I hope you guys have the same goal in life and in your walk with God. So with that, let us pray. Father, I thank you for an opportunity to preach your word. I thank you for the calling you have on my life. But I also thank you for each person in here who you have given the same authority to preach your word, the same authority to go out and to represent you among those who don't know you. I pray you encourage them I pray that you guide their steps, you guide their thoughts and their words, that they would trust you and that they would lean on you for understanding and guidance as they try to be faithful to what you've given us. And I pray also for our community. I pray that hearts would be softened, eyes would be open, and ears would be able to hear your testimony of who you are and what you've done in us as your body. And I pray that they, everyone here would be safe and that we would enjoy our day and honor you today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.